Welcome to chapter eight. Chapter eight is about hypothesis testing. And hypothesis testing will take probably quite a bit of work for us to understand the um, actual technology use and the number crunching and things like that are no harder than in any of our other chapters, uh, maybe in some way even a little bit easier. Um, however, the ideas behind them are definitely challenging to wrap your mind around. And so we're gonna spend uh, a little extra time talking about this uh, topic uh, in these sections moving forward. And so we begin at the beginning with basics of hypothesis testing in 8.1. And then once we've talked about the basics and tried to get the ideas of hypothesis testing, the strategy and the approach we use in 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4 is basically what we discussed in 8.1. So in 8.1, we introduce the basics of hypothesis testing. Then in the next three sections, we simply take turns applying it to our three typically collected statistics, a proportion, a mean, or a standard deviation. So we perform hypothesis tests on a proportion, on a mean, and on a standard deviation for the rest of the chapter. Um, but in all of those following sections, we are using the idea that we're introducing in 8.1. And as you can see, uh, the slideshow is 57 slides long. We will not be able to get through the entire thing in our introduction. Um, but my goal will be to explain the ideas well enough and clearly enough so that you could then go through the rest of the slides yourself and hopefully that the tools used in StatCrunch will make sense when we use those to do problems on the uh, assignments. All right, so let's look at our key concept. In this section, we present key components of a formal hypothesis test. The concepts in this section are general and apply to hypothesis tests involving proportions, means, and standard deviations or variances. And as I was just pointing out, uh, they go into more specifics and do examples for proportions in 8.2, for means in 8.3, and for standard deviations and variances in 8.4. Um, so these concepts in the first sections are what we use to set up for the work we do in the following sections. So we're gonna start just by trying to define the idea of what these things are. And then I will try to illustrate with a simple example that we can try to keep in mind as we then look at the examples that they provide, which are, I'll just say a little less, less simple and uh, a little harder to follow if we haven't thought about it a bit first. So hypothesis. In statistics, a hypothesis is a claim or statement about a property of a population. And as we can immediately apply to our examples, the property of the population will be something like the value of a particular proportion or the value of a particular mean or of a standard deviation. So uh, an example of a hypothesis would be if I was thinking about all the students at DVC and how tall they are, that's a property of a population, I could make a claim. Like I could say something like, I believe that the mean height of all students at DVC is greater than five foot eight. That's a hypothesis. I, I am speculating, I have a hypothesis that the mean height of students at DVC is greater than five foot eight. Now, you can imagine uh, that if you are making a claim about sort of a parameter, that it will be a claim that involves specifying something about a value that can be measured, like about uh, a mean height or about what percentage or proportion of the population are Democrats or, um, or what the standard deviation of the population is or something like that. So that imagine thinking about, I believe this parameter for the population has a value that's either equal to a number or is greater than a number or is less than a number. That's the, that's the way a statistics hypothesis will be uh, formatted. 
So then a hypothesis test you can think of is a way to test your claim, to test your hypothesis, to do a sample study to see if your claim is supported by the results of a sample or if the results of a sample don't really support your claim. A hypothesis test or test of significance is a procedure for testing a claim about a property of a population. And I think they're going to move into, yeah, they're going to move into a six slide example that's probably a bit overwhelming. So let's pause here and try to discuss this a little bit more ourselves, uh, highlight with a little bit more examples and maybe introduce a little bit of notation. Um, so I started with an example of a hypothesis. So I said something like uh, mean student height at DVC is more than five foot eight inches. So hypothesis, and sometimes also the word is claim. So if I had that as a claim or a hypothesis about the student um, mean height, then I could move on to say, I'm going to try to test this. And so how would I test that? Well, uh, as you would expect, we would take a sample. I could say, all right, I'm gonna sample, take a sample of 100 randomly chosen students at DVC, and I'm going to measure their height, and then I'm gonna see what the mean height of my sample is. And then it will become a question of, do I think the results I got from my sample provides evidence in support of my claim or not? And you can think of this initially in a very, very simple way. So for example, let's say I took a 100 students at DVC and I'm testing the claim that I think the average or mean height of students at DVC will be more than five foot eight. And when I look at my sample, the mean that I get is five foot five. Well, since the, the sample that I took isn't even in the area that I'm claiming that all of the population is over five foot eight, my hundred people had less than five foot eight, I think it would be pretty comfortable to say, well, that doesn't really support your claim because you thought the mean was more than five foot eight and you took a sample and it was less than five foot eight. So that doesn't really support what you're saying. On the other hand, if I took a mean of a hundred student sample and the mean ended up being five foot ten. Well, then you could say, well, you thought the mean of everybody was over five foot eight and you just randomly grabbed a hundred people and you got five foot ten. That's not even a bit above five foot eight. That's a couple full inches above five foot eight. So that seems to somewhat support your claim that everyone in general, for all the students, the parameter would have a mean height of, of or the, over five foot eight. But you could also imagine that, you know, it's still a little bit of vague discussion. And because you randomly chose 100 people, we have this long standing issue that maybe the results of your sample happen due to just random chance and who you happen to choose. And so, for example, if I say, well, I, I believe the mean is over five foot eight, and I take my sample of 100 students and I get five foot eight and one half of an inch. Well, that is a smidgen above five foot eight. So that is above five foot eight, but just barely. So do we say that is in support of my claim or not? You could easily imagine that the average or mean height might be below five foot eight, like five foot seven, but just randomly picking people, I might get five foot eight and a half, even if my claim was wrong. And so that's where the math will come into play. And that's where we'll need to introduce this idea of when is it that the evidence from a sample 
is concluded to be in support of the claim or when is the sample's evidence not supportive or insufficient to support the claim? And we'll have to talk about the idea behind how to do that. So let's begin with this. Is there anyone who can offer up an example of a hypothesis for a population of any kind? Just make one up, see if you could do it. And if you don't wanna share it, try to make it up on your own just to wrap your, your head around what we're talking about. Um, but if you're willing to share it, that could be, of course, helpful as well. Any suggestions for a hypothesis or claim about a population? Um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking of is like maybe a hypothesis would be that let's say 15 or maybe 20 percent of all DVC students on a particular day are wearing at least one article of clothes that is blue. Okay and so that is a claim about a proportion right so you said and you said at least 20 percent so I will help us a little bit now with a little bit of formality that when we make a claim the claim will be one of three numerical things. You have a parameter is equal to a number. You have a parameter is less than a number, or you have that a parameter is greater than a number. That looks bad. And we're going to just for mathematical and logical reasons say we need to have a claim in one of these three categories, one of these three types of claims. And so I'm going to be uh, focus on your claim was that the proportion of students at DVC wearing an article of blue clothing is at least 20 percent. Was that the correct statement? That, am I correct on what the statement was that your claim made? Uh, yes. Okay, so at least translates into greater than or equal to. And so okay. we, we will, uh, even though that's perfectly reasonable, <laughs> And it is definitely a claim about the population, logically and mathematically, even though it's not a lot of difference when you're making the claim, logically and mathematically, it's much more challenging because your claim has two possibilities. Well, are you claiming that it's greater than 20% or are you claiming that it's equal to 20%? Well, you're claiming one or the other is fine. So in order to simplify the math and the logic, we're only going to claim an individual claim, not a composition claim like that. So we never wanna claim an inequality that's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. It would wanna be strictly equal to, less than or greater than. And so to make your claim basically the same thing you said without a huge significant difference, but still mathematically doable with the tools that we're gonna create for ourselves here. I would modify it and say that your claim would be better suited for our statistical work if you instead said that, instead of saying at least 20% was wearing an article of blue clothing, that more than 20% was wearing an article of blue clothing, or that exactly 20% was wearing an article of blue clothing or less than 20%. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. All right. So of course, logically, it doesn't sound like it makes a difference, but it, you will see that this ends up becoming important and uh, uh, helpful for us to understand this in the beginning. So let's make that claim using symbology to start to introduce the idea of how we would write something like that out. So your claim was about a P value. So I'm gonna say claim, whoops. Your claim was that P, the proportion of the population, uh, do you wanna say greater than 20% or equal to 20%? Let you choose. 
I think I'll go with greater. So they, you're basically saying, I think more than 20% of the people at DVC wear at least one article of blue clothing. So then a claim is that the proportion would be greater than 0 0.20, where we understand from the description of the problem that the proportion we're talking about is the uh, people who, yes, have at least one article of blue clothing. Okay, so once we have a claim in one of these three categories, then we're going to also simultaneously define the idea that you're wrong, that the claim is wrong. So if wrong, then P is less than or equal to 0 0.20. So if you're making a claim that a proportion of students at DVC wearing at least one article of blue clothing is greater than 20%, then that could be correct. But if it's not, then it would instead be true that the proportion of students at DVC wearing one article of blue clothing is less than or equal to 20%. The claim that we're making for a hypothesis will never contain equality unless it is equality. It will never be a compound. It'll either be it's equal to a number or it's less than or greater than. So the claim is always in one of these three and then the alternate to the claim, the idea that the claim is unjustified, is not true, will be um, the opposite of that. And it will be multiple ways that that could be the case. The case. So if I claim that the proportion is greater than 20%, then that's wrong if it's equal to 20% or less than 20%. If I claim that the proportion was equal to 20%, well, then that would be wrong any way that it's not equal to 20%, which could happen if it was bigger than 20% or if it was less than 20%. So the, the claim being wrong will be able to happen in one of two ways, where the claim being correct can only happen in one way. Questions, comments, discussions about that? So I'm trying to simultaneously here look at the idea of what a hypothesis claim is in statistics and get the idea of a basic example of that while also providing some initial structure that we have to utilize in order to apply statistical methods to test a claim. And the structure is that the kind of claims we will test involve equality less than or greater than and that that claim is then unjustified or is not supported by the sample as thought to possibly be wrong and that that could happen in multiple ways where the value is wrong if it is either not equal to what was claimed or is greater than or less to something that was claimed to be um, equal anyway. I think I'm going on too much. <laughs> All right, so can anyone else just give us one more example of a possible hypothesis to think about? Maybe the mean of money spent at a grocery store is less than $100. Nice, that's great. That sounds like something that could be very interesting to people running a business. Um, and that's a claim because it's about a parameter, a mean value. And so you could sample people at the grocery store and see how much they spent and take the mean of your sample and see if the mean of your sample looks like it's in support of the claim that in general on the mean would be less than $100 or that it's not supported and that your claim was wrong, which would happen if um, Instead, we think that it's possible or easily likely that on average people spend $100 or more. Okay, so we've got three examples that we've talked about that we can try to keep in mind. 
And having done that, now let's look at their first example and where they take us with it and see if we can follow along. So they have six slides to discuss the example. And the claim that they're gonna look at is that the majority of consumers are not comfortable with drone deliveries. And so they're already gonna talk about their sample here for a second. So let's have this sample, let's imagine that this sample was taken in order to test the claim that they have in their title because they kind of lose sight of that here for a, sec for a second. So what is the claim? The majority of consumers are not comfortable with drone deliveries. So that means you're asking people, are you comfortable with drone deliveries? And they just say yes or no. And to say a majority is a proportion of the population. So they do discuss here the idea that to claim that the proportion, uh, the claim is equivalent to the claim that the proportion is greater than half or that P is greater than 0 0.5. So if we have this claim, that claim translates into, as I was doing in our earlier example, that P is greater than 0 0.5. So let's look at, with this claim in mind, what they found out from their sample. So they took a sample, 1,009 consumers were asked if they're comfortable with having drones deliver their purchases. And 54% or 545 of them responded with no. So I think saying no is like a success when it comes to proportion. Using P to denote the proportion of consumers not comfortable with drone deliveries, the majority claim is equivalent to the claim that the proportion is greater than half, because that's when you have a majority, or that in this case, the proportion is greater than 50%. And so we get this symbolic form of the original claim. Just like comparing to the claim we looked at before, where the uh, proportion of students wearing one article of blue clothing is greater than 20% was a claim or the mean value of heights of students at DVC is greater than five foot eight, or the mean value of um, customer purchases on a shopping trip would be less than $100. Okay, so having said that, how do they move forward with this example? Big picture. We have a claim that the proportion of population is such that it's greater than 50%. And we have a sample among our 1,009 customers. We took a sample and we looked to see what happened. So then we can ask, how many do we need to get a significantly high number who are not comfortable with drone delivery? And so what we're saying is, when we took our sample, how many of them need to say, I'm not comfortable with that, for us to grow confidence or to have evidence in support of our claim that it's more than 50%. Our sample was more than 50%, it was 54%, but is that high enough for us to think that in general that should also be true for the entire population? So let's look at how they describe this. It says at a result of 506, or 50.1% is just barely more than half. So 506 is not significantly a majority. It's not significantly high. And you could imagine that you would get that smidgen over 50% just by random chance, even if of the overall population, it wasn't more than 50%. Like what if for the overall 50 population, it's 49.8%. Well, that's not a majority. That would mean the claim is not true. But if you had 49.8% with everybody, it seems quite likely that you could easily happen to get a sample where you ended up with 50.1%. It's just not very convincing. Whereas in their next bullet point here, 
if you had a result of out of the 109 people surveyed, if, uh, I'm sorry, 1,009 people surveyed, if 1,006 of them or 99.7% said they're not comfortable with drone deliveries, that's way above a simple majority. That is clearly significantly high. So then they say, all right, so then what do we say about 54%? Is that high enough? Is that significantly high? So they're, they're using this, this phrasing, significantly high, because we've talked about significantly high numbers in statistics before. Usually we've talked about that being like in the 95% um, likelihood kind of category, or there's only 5% likely that you would get that by chance. So if you remember, significantly high can be tied to a confidence level. And that's where we're gonna go with this logic. Uh, but for now, let's try to keep the big picture in mind as the slide suggests. You can imagine that you have a claim in mind and that you look at a sample, but we have to have some way to assess or determine based on some assurity level whether we think the results of our sample are significant in support of our claim or not. In this case, if we're looking for a high enough number to show there's a majority, was the proportion of our sample significantly high to support the claim that a simple majority is not comfortable with drone deliveries? So notice they're not telling us exactly what number you would need to get from your sample to draw a conclusion, we're going to let StatCrunch do that for us. So we're going to let technology and formulas and stuff do that for us. But we want to be able to interpret the results and understand what needs to happen. And so they're giving some extreme examples to sort of show you how there has to be some cutoff point and we need some formal math to give us a cutoff point that if you made a claim that it's more than 50% and your sample was just a smidge more, it's not really convincing. Thank you. And if you instead made a claim and it was way more than you claimed, well, then, that, then that's very good evidence that your claim was, was justified. But that it's the middle ground that we have to be able to label correctly. All right, so this is two out of six slides. So now it, it refers to what I was just saying. So it just first of all, as we're trying to get this big picture in mind, technology is going to tell us what the cutoff point is. It's going to tell us based on your sample size and what your claim is, whether you're going to draw a conclusion that the results of your sample support your claim or not. And we're going to have to formalize all of that. And then we'll let technology help us draw our conclusion. Using technology, it's easy to obtain hypothesis testing results. The accompanying screen displays show results from four different technologies. So we can use computers and calculators to do all of the computational heavy lifting. So let's see their example of four technologies being used. And of course, uh, we're typically gonna be looking at something like what they're showing us here from StatCrunch, but you could use TI calculator or other things as well, an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. And so what they're focusing on is these statistics, which they boxed in red, something called the Z-stat that we've looked at, and something called the p-value that we've looked at before. Um, so we will get to that, I think, when we have set up the idea of how to formally make a hypothesis test. And at least as we go down that road with the big picture, you know, keep comfortable with the idea that you're not going to be crunching complicated formulas. You're simply going to set up what your claim is, uh, and then you'll provide that information to StatCrunch and the results of your sample that was taken. And StatCrunch will give you statistical values, and then you'll want to use those to interpret whether your the results of your survey are in support of your claim or not. Okay. Questions, comments about anything so far?
All right. So it says examining the four screen displays, we see some common elements. They all display a test statistic. They all include a P value, but we're gonna to try to focus on the understanding of how the hypothesis testing procedure works and learn the associated terminology. Only then will results from technology make sense. All right, so let's focus on this idea of significance. Hypothesis tests are also called tests of significance. In section 4.1, we used probabilities to determine when sample results are significantly low or significantly high. This chapter familiarizes these, uh, those concepts in a unified procedure that is often throughout many different fields, are used often throughout many different fields of application. So, and, and just as a default, you may remember that something is significantly high if it would only occur by random chance 5% of the time. If the likelihood of getting a result that high is less than 5%, then that's significantly high. Or if it's less than 5% that you would get that low, that low of a result by chance, then that's significantly low. And that in the middle, you have this range of values that are not significantly high or low because it's quite possible you would get them by chance, maybe 90% likely or something like that. Now that's just kind of uh, values to wrap your mind around, but those will be set by our significance level, our alpha value, like we did in previous chapters, like we did when we made a confidence interval in chapter seven. When we made a confidence interval, it was a 90% interval or a 95% interval or a 99% interval. We'll do the same thing for hypothesis tests as well. All right, so now they're gonna formalize how we literally construct our hypothesis, how we make notation to define it. And so they're introducing, we, we already introduced the hypothesis. So now they're formalizing this by specifying something called the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis denoted by H with a little sub zero there um, is a statement that the value of a population parameter such as proportion mean or standard deviation is equal to some claimed value. So the, the thing to remember with H sub H null, the null hypothesis is that it involves equality, equality of a value. So it'd be like, whoops, why did I say let? like p is equal to 0 0.20 or mu is equal to five foot eight inches so pointing this out so that i can also take note one of the example uh, claims that we were talking about before was that the mean expenditures of customers in a grocery store was less than a hundred dollars so then if i have the claim that uh, the mean of customer expenditures is less than a hundred dollars this would not be a null hypothesis. So the claims that we talked about before, you might make a claim that an, a parameter is equal to a number. I get smaller here. There we go. You might make a claim that a parameter is equal to a number. You might make a claim that a parameter is less than a number, or you might make a claim that a parameter is greater than a number. So equality is one of your options when you make a claim. 
but the other two options, greater than or less than, those are not about equality. So if your claim is that a parameter is equal to a number, then your claim will be the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis claim is always about equality. And if your claim, as in our note here, is that a parameter value is less than a number or is greater than a number, then your claim will not be the null hypothesis. Instead, it will be the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis denoted by H sub one or H sub A for alternative is a statement that the parameter has a value that somehow differs from the null hypothesis. For the methods of this chapter, the symbolic form of the alternative hypothesis must use one of these symbols, greater than, less than, or not equal to. So if, for example, I have a claim that P is greater than 20% for those uh, for wearing an article of blue clothing, then if this is not true, that implies that P is less than or equal to 20%. And so in this case, we are going to have to translate a claim and the claim not being true into a hypothesis that's the null and a hypothesis that's the alternate. This is the formality of how we set up for statistics. So let me just show you how you would do that in this case, and then hopefully they will illustrate in an example as well. So what we begin with, so we begin by setting H sub zero, the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis will always involve equality. So what we do is we, we look at our claim or the idea that our claim is not true. And we look for the one that includes equality. In this case, it would be less than or equal to. And what we do for our null hypothesis is we make that claim, but only with the equality part. So for our claim that P is greater than 20% to not be true, it would mean that P is less than or equal to 20%. So we're gonna set our null hypothesis to be that P is equal to 20%. And note, if the null hypothesis is true, if P is equal to 20%, then our claim that P is greater than 20% is false. So in this case, you could think of the null hypothesis as the closest you could be to your claim being true, but it's still being false. So if I claimed it was greater than 20%, the closest I could be to that and still be wrong if it was actually just equal to 20%, then it's not greater and I'm wrong, but it was pretty close. Now it would also be wrong if it was less than 20%, like 18, 17, 16, but only thing that needs to happen for our claim to be wrong is that it's actually equal to 20% because we were claiming that it's greater than 20%. That's the logic. Once we have set the null hypothesis, then we can then set up the alternate hypothesis. I'll use the little a for alternate. And if our claim is a claim about the parameter being greater than a number or less than a number, then our claim will be the alternate hypothesis. In this case, our alternate claim would then be that P is greater than 20%. And so notice, 
if the alternate hypothesis is true, then our claim is true. If the null hypothesis is true, then our claim is just barely false. Questions about that? All right, so this is the heart of the logic of setting up a hypothesis test in statistics. So let's see if we can illustrate that with some example. Not immediately. <laughs> so because there's going to be this logic flow, they believe this procedure with a logical flow chart, which leads to two different ways to test a hypothesis, is appropriate to shove in your face at this time, whereas I disagree. I think this will just be too much to think about at this point. They could have summarized everything at the end with this. So let's skip this for now. And you can come back to this when you've seen the whole picture and you've gone through some examples and then see if you can make sense of this overarching flow chart. But now it's too early to talk about it. And they're talking about the confidence interval method. So in this flow chart, there's these two different methods that they offer as ways to perform a test. And then they begin to talk about the confidence interval method and they throw some statistics or math numbers in your face. This is gonna make it hard for us. So I think I'm gonna, I may have to abandon the slides or at least skip some of these to see if we could do it. Let's look here if we can look. Use the original claim to create a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So this part we can look at. I'm gonna ignore the confidence level part for a second here because I think it's not helpful at this point. All right, so this part discusses what I was just suggesting. Identify the claim to be tested and express it in symbolic form. And then as an example, as we just did, P is greater than 0.20%. Step two, give the symbolic form that must be true when the original claim is false. Well, that, as I described, would be that P is less than or equal to 20%. Step three, Consider the two symbolic expressions obtained so far. The alternative hypothesis is the one not containing equality, not containing equality. So it uses the symbols less than, greater than, or not equal to. And in our case, that would be this one because the second one contains equality. The null hypothesis is the symbol or exp symbolic expression that where that the parameter equals a fixed value being considered. So we neither of our claims, our claim nor the symbolic symbology or symbolic form of our claim being wrong, neither one of those just claims something is equal. But it says the null hypothesis would be the expression you get where the parameter is equal to the fixed value being considered. So in this case, P equals 0 0.20. So to set up, in this case, the alternative hypothesis, we would just take our original claim. And then the null hypothesis would be the claim that the parameter was equal to 20%. So this is where they're trying to give you a step-by-step -step process to sort of set up the claim. Given the claim that the majority of consumers are comfortable with drone deliveries, we can apply steps one, two, and three. So here's their example. This has eight steps to it. Let's see how we can do. We have um, coincidentally eight minutes left. So steps one, two, and three. Step one, identify the claim to be tested and express it in symbolic form. The claim was that the simple majority of people don't like drone deliveries. So that translated into P being greater than 50% or 0.5. Step two, give the symbolic form that must be true when the original claim is false. If it's false, then that means P is less than or equal to 50%. Step three, 
this step is in two parts. Identify the alternative hypothesis and identify the null hypothesis and define those. So it says the alternative hypothesis, using the two expressions we just had, the one that does not include inequality is the alternative hypothesis. So we could identify H sub one or H sub A or the alternative hypothesis is the original claim that the proportion is greater than 50%. So they're saying, so we get that this is the case. Then once you've done that, create or identify the null hypothesis. And that is that the P value that you have is equal to the value of the claim where you add equality. So even though in our claim being wrong, we had less than or equal to, we drop the less than part and we say, well, all you need to be wrong for the null hypothesis is that P is equal to 50%. And now that, that's how you set that up. Okay, so looking at an actual problem from our first homework on 8.1 and 8.2, it starts by giving us a claim. It says most adults would erase all of their personal information online if they could. So that's kind of like the majority of people don't like drone deliveries. That's a simple majority. When they say most, that just means more than half. So that's a claim that's being made that basically a p-value is greater than 50%. Then they tell us that to test this claim, they took 697 people and that a portion of them said they would erase all their data. And then they ask us to do something called find the value of the test statistic. So we would need to go through the steps of setting up the hypothesis, null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis to find this test statistic they're asking for. So let me show you how to find the test statistic, even though we're not really clear how that's answering a question or anything yet. So I'm gonna open up StatCrunch. And we can at least see the beginning steps of how the hypothesis test and how to set it up is important to what we're doing here. So this is about a proportion. So I'm going to go to stat. And like we used in chapter seven for a confidence interval, I'm going to go to proportion stats with one sample. And in this case, they didn't give us a big list of data to put in a column, they summarized it. So I'm gonna go with summary. And so I'm going to enter the results of our sample, which was the, of the, there was 63% uh, successes out of 697. Now in StatCrunch, they, they can't put in the percentage or the proportion, they want how many out of your observations. So the observations was 697 and I need to see how much of that is 63%. So I'm gonna do 0.63 times the 697 size sample. And so it looks like it was 439 to the nearest number. So 439 is how many out of their observations would give them a 63% proportion. So now before we hop down to confidence level, but now we're going to perform a hypothesis test. And notice that to perform the hypothesis test, we need to have set up the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And that's why to use the tool in StatCrunch, we have to go through those three steps. So as we just discussed, our claim is that P is greater than 50%. And that would lead to an alternative hypothesis that P is equal to 50%. So what I'm going to do here is that, I'm sorry, that would lead to a, um, a hypothesis of being wrong equal to 50%, which is the null hypothesis. So in this case, that happens to be the default. So our null hypothesis is that P is equal to 50%. And then our alternative was that it is greater than 50% because it's um, most adults would mean more than 50%. So I would set my alternative hypothesis to be greater than 50%. And I would set my null hypothesis to be equal to 50%. And then I compute. 
And as we saw with earlier work, the test statistic is the Z stat. And we'll talk about what that means logically a little bit more, but already we could do this problem if we knew how to set up the null and alternative hypotheses. And if I round that to two decimals, that'll become a six at the end. And that's all this problem wanted at this point. 